Hi, welcome to your Skogans, the International Law Podcast. Uh, this is an episode with, where we'll be talking to a humanitarian practitioner, a lecturer, and a film producer at Advocacy Productions uh, in Geneva. His name is uh, Stefan Ziegler. Uh, Mr. Uh, Ziegler, can you please, you know, tell me, you know, a bit about your experience, about your background, what you have been doing, what you're doing currently, and then we'll talk a bit more about your recent uh, documentary, uh, Broken, um, that that addresses a lot of issues. Uh, with regards to international law uh, and Palestine. Uh, but before coming to that, uh, you know, I'd like you to you know, tell me a bit about what you're doing and uh, what, what keeps you busy. Sure, sure. Well, listen, thank you very much, first of all, for having me and uh, secondly, for introducing me. Um, okay, well, look, uh, I'm not 25, so my life story is a bit long to tell. But what I can tell you is if we, if we use the three terms that you uh, used to introduce me, that might be a very good start. And then the rest probably comes up through, through other questions later on or, or not, okay? But uh, yes, I am, or I see myself as a humanitarian practitioner with uh, yeah, well over 20 years of experience in the field uh, at headquarters levels um, for different organizations. Um, the longest time I spent um, is with uh, ICRC uh, in the context that my film uh, is based on, also with uh, UNRWA, the UN, uh, if you wish. Um, and then I, I worked, and I still work at times, for the OSCE. Um, I worked in eastern, um, eastern Ukraine. Uh, and now I work with them as a as a uh, observer of elections. So this is kind of my bread and butter job. This is what I do. This is what I think is probably where A, I, have, I had and I have um, most impact with my work, so I hope. Um, but it's also where I learned my, I think I, I probably call it advocacy skills. It's a very large area, but I think advocacy skills through jobs in, in uh, assistance, protection, um, and so on in the field. Um, so when I say advocacy, it's that which gives people voice that may not have it otherwise, especially when it comes to conflict zones around the world where I've been working all along. Um, but it also means that... I, although I'm not a lawyer, I don't have a law background. I have an international relations background, which at master's level, you know, it's about a sixth or so based on international law. Um, I think my knowledge and understanding of law, um, I have to say, stems from working with the ICRC, um, seeing on the ground how international law, even specific articles sometimes, can be useful and can be helpful, uh, both of those. And I learned to appreciate um, predominantly through the ICRC's experience, um, how useful it can be to know law when you talk to people who are supposed to know law, be they um, people in uniform, or liaison persons between the, the army and the civil society and so on. And I think that's really the start also um, to, to my filmmaking. Um, when I say filmmaking, I should be pre precisely say uh, it's film production. I'm not a filmmaker either, but I use experts um, both in front of the camera and behind the camera to help me express what I think is important in terms of advocacy. Um, hence the name Advocacy Production, my company, uh, produ Productions, based here in Geneva. Um, and for me, advocacy without education doesn't really make sense uh, a lot either. Uh, your experience from giving voice, if you wish, or attempting to give voice to people, uh, help people out in really stressful situations in life. Um, 
I, we don't have to go very far uh, beyond Afghanistan right now. Uh, it's clear that that uh, this humanitarian um, that humanitarian practice needs a lot of brains behind it too, and it needs a lot of understanding and knowledge. And to share that with younger people coming up behind you, I think it's not only uh, you know a humbling experience which I get the chance to teach here at university, uh, at a, a private university in Geneva. Um, but it's, it's also a useful one. Um, I started teaching at university level seven years ago, and it's only now I'm starting to realize how important it is to give off yourself, your experience, your knowledge, and then hearing back what people actually made out of this eventually. And uh, it's very gratifying. And it's also very nice to know that some of the students uh, have taken things very seriously. And uh, you've been able to influence maybe, maybe even their career path um, and for them to come back and give you feedback. Because to teach without feedback is like, it's like doing advocacy without feedback. OK, so that was the short introduction. <laughs> no, no, that, that's that's uh, really uh, you know, insightful and very extensive, uh, very diverse experiences you've had. So before I understand your you know journey and transition into you know film producing and advocacy, I'd like to understand how was your experience applying international law and humanitarian law on the ground while you worked with these international organizations for such a long period? Um, okay, I think I think in inbuilt into the Geneva Conventions is a Call it philosophy or a big thought of reciprocity. So I mean, it's true for it's built into the religions of the world and, and, and many other places. But to realize that you can, because you as a humanitarian practitioner, you operate between uh, warring factions, conflict parties, um, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and that space is normally reserved only to, to armies and, and warring um, uh, um, well, soldiers to, 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 to warfare and so on and so forth. And I'm talking literally, geographically, it's true, but also uh, in, in, a, in terms of international law. Here, I'm predominantly making reference to the Geneva Conventions, OK? Um, to have the trust of, let's say, one or the other side is fine, but to have trust on both sides is a skill. It's not just law that gives you tools to be able to say, well, you know, think about it. If your behavior on the ground to civilians, uh, it, and in the theater in itself um, should be, um, well, first of all, it should be according to certain norms, the, the conventions, but if norms are broken, it should be seen as how can we go back to, to, to a, a level where these norms are actually adhered to? And that you can only do through negotiations between two or multiple sides to this conflict, where I believe international law in this sense becomes a language in itself. I had a very interesting conversation with the president of an African state who uh, passed through our university um, um, as a dignitary, obviously, and I had the, um, the opportunity to have lunch with him. Um, and it's a, an African country, it doesn't matter which one uh, at all, um, where he shares <laughs> his presidency um, or the presidency uh, over the years with his enemy. So each time, you know, it's like a it's like a yo-yo. These two people, um, you know, sometimes it's this faction, then it's the other faction at the helm um, of the country. And both of them 
are army decorated uh, people. They are uh, also generals. And he said to me one day at that day, he said over lunch, he said, you know, Stefan, I think what you're doing with your film is important because my experience is the only language that I can actually use with my enemy, with the other, is the language of international law, because everything else makes zero sense. We talk about, although we use the same name for the country, we talk about a different type of cultural experience. We talk about a different language very often. We have very different experience of uh, well-being, health, access to education and everything, always depending on who sits in what chair. But he says, the one moment when I and my enemy agree on something is when we use the same language, such as this is not the type of behavior we should do because it has a, a much higher framework. It's not national law. It's really on a, on a, on a higher um, ground. And that made a lot of sense to me. Uh, and I think it makes a lot of sense to people that are listening now, because why should somebody that's in a stronger position adhere to international law when actually, as long as they don't leave their country, they're quite safe um, in the future, at least <laughs> to a degree, okay? Yeah. Right? And, and I think that's where the ground starts not with the foot soldiers and whether you tell him look if you treat this um this poor person here this way you know imagine and of course this is important as an argument then imagine that if this is your sister on the other side of this line here um and they treat her like this yes this is also reciprocity and i think it's important this is the tool on the ground but i think it really transcends from the idea and the ideology of why the Red Cross was established in the very beginning uh, is to find ways in which you can actually understand each other, although you have no respect or understanding for each other in other terms. Um, I hope that answered your question. Uh, no, no, it, it does. Uh, and before, before I move on, I like to apologize if there's some background noise, uh, because, you know, we're currently in a small studio apartment and my wife is also having a work call. Uh, so, but, but I didn't want to delay, delay this any further. So I, you know, uh, I hope that it's not an issue. If it, if it happens, just let me know. No, no problem. With, but for me, absolutely not. Okay, problem. that's perfect. Uh, so I've been working in noisier places in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. You know, given your diverse experience, um, so you know that there's a lot to unpack there. You talk about reciprocity and the common language of international law. Uh, I like to come directly to you know something that speaks that common language of international law, and I see that poster behind you of uh, your film, uh, Broken. So I want to talk about uh, the documentary. Uh, you know, which which I've, uh, you know, viewed multiple times and it's, it's you know, incredible viewing. Uh, there, there, there's a lot of things that I want to talk about. Um, and it seems to, you know, bridge that gap between education and humanitarian advocacy that you talked about or humanitarian diplomacy. Um, mm -hmm. So what I want to understand is how did you envision turning your career uh, from a humanitarian expert to a film producer? Uh, in this regard? Hmm. Actually, <laughs> it didn't. <laughs> I'm still both. I still see myself in both ways. Uh, in a 10 days time, I will be showing this film in a country that's at war with another country in the location where that is happening. Um, I'm not there to help out with food parcels or anything like that that uh, there is there's other people to do this now but um trying to make sure that we can get people even in uniform to watch this film um it's the first such experience with my film okay not in general but 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 with that film and and i'm hopeful and i will tell you in a few weeks time um, the experience that we will gain from it. 
But for me, what's more important is it is not in where the film was made. It is a country that is not Palestine, Israel. And when I made the film, it was very clearly, at least it was very clear to me, although not to everybody, that um, the film is about international law, this type of law, right, of conflict and so on. And that it ought to be watched for not the story inside so much about the example that we're using Palestine and, and, and Israel, the West Bank and the wall, but to say, well, hang on, there is something in this film which clearly points to most of us believing that international law is breaking our is breaking the promises to the people who are after all representative of the united nations and so on um, and this is, will be the first time that i want to hold up that mirror to people that are under distress um, and i'm not there to judge anybody but what i'm trying to do is to see to what degree my film can be part of the language that I ex explained earlier on. Okay. Um, so the film is, we would probably now uh, say, it's a film on international law at the example of the ICJ's wall opinion in 2004, um, which illustrates how much work cognitively and emotionally goes into a process in The Hague, even if the outcome is almost zero. And we're asking people in the film, how come it didn't actually have a bigger impact, right? So we take it away from Palestine, Israel. There's enough films made on that. Okay, the press is there every day of the year. I mean, we this is the most most highly um, you know mediatized uh, conflict in the whole world. If somebody breaks a leg, it will be reported on. Where in other places, it takes eight hundred people to die. So, and I'm I'm maybe being a, a bit uh, cynical about this, um, which I intend. Um, I've yeah. been there, so yeah. uh, you know, but but really, it is to say let's think about this you know yes we have laws why are they not implemented in the way they were intended to maybe um and what can we do to strengthen the process of international law right no that that makes a lot of sense uh i realized that you, you worked in the west bank for a few years you also mentioned that in the documentary uh, mm -hmm. so what was the you know main driving force behind making this uh, film on palestine given that you said that uh, there, there there's a lot of uh, material already uh, already available uh, i i understand you know that there, there, there's a lot of uh, comments by former judges of the icj and other tribunals in the documentary which probably hasn't been seen in that uh, uh, you know case uh, in in that fashion before mm -hmm. so what was the big idea behind making uh, broken um, okay, uh, I'm giving away that I'm not a, a very a linear thinker, okay? I'm very lateral in my approach. I think that's why I can do 10,000 things at the same time. But it's difficult sometimes to express it. Okay, now you get the brandest and hottest news from our company right delivered into your podcast. I ask myself that also, and I ask myself that seven years after we made the film uh, or sorry when we started the film okay right and why do i ask myself that because you know i'm a great believer that you're, you you personally evolve and so do your ideas and to say well i just went to palestine someday and i started working with uh, uh, with the icrc there and then you know i this whole thing with the wall came up yeah that's a that's a story that i can tell easily um, and that can be imagined, as you said, I spent 10 years working in Palestine and in the West Bank. Um, why 
has to do with the fact that it was a very strong emotional and very strong um, uh, uh, relevance to, 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 to my past and, and my experience. So why is it brand hot? To, for two reasons. One, we got the opportunity for an international journal, academic journal, to actually ask that question. Why and how did the, did the idea turn into a film? And this will be out in a few months time, hopefully in January, um, and will be published. But as I was co-writing this piece, I realized there is something else behind it. And it has a lot to do with the Cold War. And we just premiered our film in Russian, uh, maybe five, six weeks ago. And when I, when I read a little bit about the place in St. Petersburg, where my film was going to be promoted, awarded, and so on and so forth, I realized there is a little museum somewhere hidden away, which shows art, especially uh, paint, you know, spray paintings um, and um, murals and so on, that are, I would say, they're almost the exact same techniques that were on the western side of the Berlin Wall. So when I got there, I was probably about 12 or 13 years old, I was impressed by this wall, uh, negatively impressed, but also impressed because it's just so contrary to everything that we think about. And therefore, um, this stayed with me. And when I went, went home in the next few years, it was the time when the Cold War was at its hottest, <laughs> if you excuse my pun. Um, and I remember during those formative, let's say, uh, teenage years, how much I was afraid that the Third World War would break out. And the embodiment or the yeah, embodiment of the, these ideas were clearly latched on to the wall in Berlin. So when I got the invitation to go to St. Petersburg, I found a museum that exhibited that type of art. And we made a short documentary with me telling my story about how I ended up not only making the film now, but also teaching with it and so on, and where I thought the actual um, starting point was. And I think it was the Cold War in me, the wall, and when this thing uh, started in, in Palestine, I was there at the time when, um, when uh, Israel decided to build this wall. And, um, and this has never left me. These, you know, these are strong emotions, um, which, although law can be seen as a very cold type of thing, but I think emotions are extremely important in law um, to, to evoke. And this is what happened with me. So I think it's a, it's a, um, it's a long <laughs> answer to a relatively short question, but it shows the progression between who you are, what you're made up of, and what you're then capable of doing because the motivation doesn't get killed. It gets stronger over time. Eventually you realize, and it's in my little, uh, on my webpage, uh, you may have uh, seen, there is a, what's called the producer statement. It's about one minute and a half of an uh, interview with me where I'm yeah. saying, you know, um, this is, you can't leave anymore. And it's not because I think I'm, I'm, I'm uh, indispensable or anything like that, but you realize with a certain expertise, comes a responsibility. And I think judges must feel that very strongly, that you would know things that you cannot just give out of your hand because you can't be sure whether somebody else can actually, actually do it. And this is the continuation now of also, when we go back to, my, to your earlier question, where now I still feel I'm very much part of the humanitarian practicing, uh, you know, um, um, crowd, <laughs> call it whatever, the, uh, you know, practitioners, okay, in the humanitarian area, because, because humanitarianism is so multifaceted. So you fit in, in my case now, as a, as a lecturer, 
using obviously these examples and so on doing film and and to me nothing has changed in that sense okay well that, that makes a lot of sense and thank you for that elaboration <clears throat> that helps me understand you know your chain of thought and you just seem like an all-rounder you know who does all you know things at the same time uh, i'm glad that you brought the producer statement i wanted to talk about that a little later uh, but yeah it's, it's a good time to you know go into that there's one specific thing that you know i no noted down uh, it's something that you said at the end and i like to begin from there and then you know you know ask a, a question so you know i quote you say in in, in the documentary mm -hmm. uh, if international law was as strong as this wall here this wall wouldn't be here i'm not naive to believe my film is going to bring down the wall but if it strengthens international law i'll be a very happy man um so so taking you know this uh, you know perspective that that you've developed uh, working in the west bank and over the years in your you know career i want to understand your perspective on you know in a more macro level the relevance of international law and how it can be strengthened because you know as you say the wall advisory opinion came out its implementation was never done uh, and you know you, you mentioned that you know it, in a, in a lot of these activities, you know, there's a lot of advocacy. There a lot of there's a lot of activism, but the outcomes are usually um, very minimal mm -hmm. in terms of the impact that you know uh, people are uh, uh, working towards. So, how do you uh, you know connect all of this? Okay, uh, first disclaimer: as I said, I'm not a law expert, so I don't uh, pretend that I know uh, the answer from that point of view which obviously will be um, you know, left to your, your, uh, your viewers um, or listeners. But I have, by now, I think, acquired a very special knowledge about in international law, OK? And that is the connection. And it's an advocacy drive, OK? It's the connection between how law is taught and how law is implemented or not, OK? Um, maybe I sound very arrogant uh, when I say that I think those people that should have the most knowledge in the field, I'm talking about human beings, I'm not talking at uh, academic level, the people that should have most knowledge of international law are diplomats. Diplomats are the ones that sit in certain headquarters, uh, sorry, capitals, and have access to warring sites that even us us we humanitarians will only dream of my experience is and i took hundreds and hundreds of such diplomats um, on upon their request or the request of their embassies onto humanitarian diplomacy tours along the wall um, for years and i have to tell you i'm very dissatisfied well i'm disgruntled by the fact that those people who should know let's say a little bit about geneva conventions and so on in very often are not knowledgeable enough about the law which even if diplomats are not supposed to do um you know advocacy in the same way that humanitarians do but they have influence and i always say and i don't directly quote but in the in the um uh in the advisory opinion of 2004 on the last pages it clearly says if those two parties um involved in the dispute do not do anything or cannot for whatever reasons, the residual workload is to the 200 other states in the world, um, the international community, the United Nations. And that is probably the one point that you see in my film, uh, even if it's not said, it's clearly 
there as an underlying um, kind of a question mark. How come even we knew, I mean, this I think everybody knew, uh, the Palestinians as much as the Israelis, that the actual um, court case at the ICJ and then also uh, the GA, the, the, the General Assembly uh, vote, wouldn't change how Israel and Palestine directly you know, communicate with each other. I think that that was very clear. But the fact is that most people didn't think that this case would actually come to the court in the first place. But when you look at what has, what has happened since, and I had a project in the West Bank that was funded by the international community, that was funded to take stock, eval uh, evaluate, monitor the impacts, the humanitarian impacts of the war on communities in Palestine. And you see there, zero happened. I know that politics is stronger than international law. I think this is a fact, but it's still kind of strange to see that we're all sitting, we as a human race, sitting around you know, a table in The Hague and we have a judgment and those that are supporting these court cases financially and otherwise took very little. And I'm saying very little because of very few countries that actually took action uh, after the, the court case or after the, the, um, the advisory opinion. So to come back to your question from the point of view, what is it that I, I believe can be done is teach law not to elites. <laughs> Make law accessible to a multitude of all audiences so that people with law backgrounds, and I'm sorry to say this in, uh, in this podcast, you know, don't actually believe they're a special, a special chosen people, which we know this is very often a problem. Lawyers have a very different way of looking at, at the rest of the world. Um, and sometimes write this one and, and you know, they derive an awful lot of skills from that. But I also think that they are not so much part of the general public or society that would actually be conducive to furthering their own needs, which is the implementation of the law, okay? And if you allow me another two minutes, I will tell you what have I done since I very strongly realized all of this. Now, again, this is brand hot stuff, which has not really sorted out yet, but I'm, I, I, I'm very happy to reveal what we're uh, doing at the moment. We have taken the film broken, <laughs> broke it into parts and got a professional uh, newsreader and a, a one year attempt of breaking law language into language that a 14 year old can understand. So we've, we're creating a film called Broken for the Curious. And it's a subtitle we are calling it probably because it's not yet uh, fully there, but just to, to tell you why, an illustrated documentary about international law. And the illustration comes from asking questions that 14 year olds can sort out in their heads. And that will mean, hopefully, that our larger version of our current film will make it into secondary schools, Lyceum, you know, high schools, universities, cinemas, any place where people can don't feel stupid if they don't know what international law is. So that I think is going to have a little bit of an impact beyond uh, simply, uh, you know, advocating for international law. I think this is really to teach and awake people's imaginations from a much earlier age. Okay. Very interesting. Uh, so the, the, there's a lot I want to you know, address uh, in, in what you've responded. 
firstly you know i i completely agree with you that you know being a lawyer and somebody who has worked with international law there there is a tendency for international lawyers to monopolize any uh, understanding or comment commentary on international law and also lawyers generally tend to have like a very uh, focused or one dimensional approach in addressing an issue which which can have uh, implications uh, uh, in in a, in a broader context um secondly you know you 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 talked about uh, you know breaking down broken into you know smaller pieces uh, and you know distributing it for targeted audiences uh, so yeah i i want to talk about um, i don't like using the word it's very corporate but the marketing aspect of it um you know before we started recording you know you spoke about you know some of the challenges that you faced in terms of uh, financing the film and then promoting it Uh, so what what i want to understand is how do you and how did you reach out to different uh, stakeholders uh, like academic institutions universities practitioners and people in general in with with broken uh, because i and i also want to understand how, how much uh, the subject of the documentary in terms of the palestine israel conflict had to do with the response that you uh, received hmm. uh you see me in my gray hair right <laughs> i i can't see many I, <laughs> i didn't have that when i before i started um advocating for my film and and trying to get donors interests and 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 not just financial but also other interests and i always thought about myself that i'm a quite a good advocate when it comes to it uh, because i've lived different lives if you wish uh, i can go get in and out of roles very quickly and 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 thus uh, hopefully you know help um, beneficiaries uh, in that sense but when it came to <laughs> advertising my own film i said i'm not going to make any compromise on the subtitle palestinian uh, palestinian journey through international law because that's what it is there is no two ways about this but it has cost me dearly <laughs> because the word palestine in a film title you know that really didn't work and i can tell you now that i spent four years trying to get financing um about 3000 lectures and you know phone calls later i got zero money for my film um that i regret I regret that for the same reason that I told you earlier on that I think it is up to the international community to help implement the uh, advisory opinion and I used that argument not overtly but I was in contact with I mean organizations individuals um states representatives um etc etc um and there was no will there was no will because people didn't want to understand what, what this film was about it's only in the last half a year as i told you that people are getting to understand that in fact our film is and maybe this sounds facetious but i can tell you people are starting to realize that our film is the extended role of what the uh, advisory opinion mentions of the international community doing something for the implementation and even i didn't think of it that way because no i thought i would be termed very arrogant but now i can tell you because of the the, the feedback that i'm getting and the feedback comes from a lot of ac- academics at very high level ordering copies of the film to be taught and are already teaching it at universities to international law uh, international relations sociology whatever you know uh, quite a large plethora of people um we now get inquiries from even from secondary school uh, teachers to say this is a film and we had a very nice experience with a canadian uh, teacher um who had a, a law degree but is a teacher now um you know trying to help understand what's in the film to 
to those that certainly don't have this um, um, uh, readily, you know, because they're a very young people or because, um, well, they, you know, in secondary school, you're not ex exactly talking about international law ordinarily, although we hope that this will change over time. Um, so we had uh, people coming back to us, um, like one of the probably most humid, <laughs> one of the most um, uh, humble uh, experience that we had in the last few months was a phone call from an, from a, from an, a journal, um, a journal combined with um, with ac action, an action-driven journal, international law from uh, in, from the Chicago area, and this lady lady calls me up and she says, "Do you remember me? We got to know each other in." Uh, and this, I think, is a very poignant uh, example. She said, "We talked to each other um, about a year ago. We got to know each other through LinkedIn." And I said, yeah, I, I remember your name. And I said, what can I do for you? She said, we are organizing a peace summit for Cameroon. <laughs> okay, sure. And I said, what, what can I do for you? She said, you have spoken to me that time on the phone with such emotive, you know, and cognitively very strong arguments that she said, I think you're the right person to come in as a keynote speaker. And I said, okay. Now, I <laughs> never dreamt of this, um, but I can tell you it, it opened my eyes to the importance that a film can have, or the importance it can have in terms of implementation of law in this case, maybe. So I ended up presenting international law representatives academics, uh, special rapporteurs, and so on, that we had already filmed in the film, but also that we're filming as part of another project. And I used their talk in their interviews, the podcasts, if you wish, and I puzzled them together to make it relevant to the arguments that these other keynote speakers brought up. And so we spent with them all together about two and a half hours on on what I said had had what was bringing in together with film and stuff, but it was a five day um, it was a five day summit that brought former Nobel Prize Peace Prize winners to talk that brought in Irish uh, a very prominent Irish peace negotiator that brought in people from uh, Sri Lanka from all over the world. And I, it, for, a, for a moment, uh, Omar, you can imagine, I'm going, what am I doing here? But I took the role and I did what I could. And I got very positive feedback. We also, in, in the run up to it, we got the two warring parties um, in that part of Cameroon that we're talking about to actually, first of all, make a podcast each, and in the final run, have a talk. And this hadn't happened in 20 years. So I think when we talk about implementation of international law, as Bruno Sima says in my film, okay, um, takes a long time. Yes, it may take a long time, but you know, this is strong stuff. And this comes from civil society. This wasn't imposed by the big powers in the world or something. Okay. Um, before we you know, move on to the latter part of this, this uh, discussion, I wanted to ask for you know, purely selfish reasons, how did you get so many judges or uh, you know, international courts and tribunals to come on camera and talk about something which is uh, uh, you know, relatively controversial uh, and sensitive? Okay, that question <laughs> is... I'm not going to give you the long answer, but that question is incredibly important for your listeners. That I'm sure. And for myself. <laughs> and for you. 
And I'm giving you an answer that took us years to think about. But do you remember how I talked to you about what it says at the end of the, of the uh, advisory opinion with the you know, international community? Yeah. The, there was very few things that happened. I'll tell you because it's, 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 it comes to exactly why I think that these judges um, uh, have contributed. After the advisory uh, opinion was delivered to the GA, the Swiss government has did some kind of a monitoring of, you know, how is it implemented, uh, does it go, go well, and so on. And the now head of the ICRC, um, um, uh, what's his name now, sorry, but the head of the ICRC, the Peter, president of the ICRC. Uh, Br not uh, his, Peter, no, his name is Peter, Peter Moore, Moore, if I'm not wrong. Maurer, sorry, excuse Maurer. me. Okay, yeah. I'll start again. So the president of, of uh, uh, the, the current president of the ICRC was a top Swiss diplomat um, representing Switzerland vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United Nations. And he delivered this, this kind of, you would call it a monitoring and evaluation report nowadays, okay, to the GA a year after. It, it, after the, the, the court case came out on the 9th of July. So that's one way in which the international community followed up. The second one was, was an organization that was set up through, I believe, the po political affairs offices in the UN in uh, New York. And that is um, a registrar, so registrar of damages, of the wall. So it's called the, the, the agency that it became later, later on, um, and that was uh, situated in, in or, or headquartered in Vienna, was called UNRWAD, United Nations Registrar of Damages, paid for by about 15 countries, as far as I remember. It is now final. They've taken on, you know, uh, all the physical uh, um, um, uh, uh, damages, if you wish, uh, of the wall, physical to people and so on, not emotional or, or anything else, of course not, anything that can be kind of traced. They've done this along the 700 kilometers of the wall. And that's another expression of the international community. One of the countries in there was Switzerland. Again, Switzerland has, I think through the Geneva Conventions anyway, has a special role to play when nobody else is there to 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 kind of uh, maintain uh, the, the 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 cases and so on. Switzerland um, financed my barrier monitoring unit in the UN in Palestine. I believe out of the same out of the same motivation. We still ought to do something because nobody else was doing anything or much anymore, okay? Um, around that time, the United Nations um, Humanitarian Office, UN OCHA, you know, I, what I would always say, um, let the discourse go. There, there was no more discourse on the world's impact, except for my little unit that the Swiss were financing through UNRWA. And three years later, that was the end of it. It came to an end for various reasons, which are not so important here. Um, that's when I believe the international community died on this case. Because nobody was monitoring the impact, you know, very few people, a few human rights organizations, but nobody really did it in a concerted effort uh, stemming from, from, that, from that last few pages of the, 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 um, the opinion. So 14 years later, and I'm still continuing doing my work on, on world related issues, which I see as a residual kind of part Although I'm an individual, but I have an awful lot of people behind me, and I do believe a lot of the people on the ground in Palestine, especially in the villages where we work, you know, 
express will for somebody or for the international community to keeping monitoring to keep monitoring the impacts because otherwise if there nobody is there if there's nobody talking about it anymore the discourse of the wall is dead which is largely true because when you go around the world nowadays and you you ask for opinion polls in my classroom out of 10 students seven have never heard of the wall in palestine and their international relations postgraduates that's so unfortunate I, yeah that is yeah but there is a reason this is kind of all this kind of stuff just gets pushed away with other things to do but i but i keep my head above water and i said okay we do this film let's see whether judges will tell you something that is worth knowing about and when you ask the reason why they came in front of the camera i think they had that in mind because if they don't go in front of the camera, it means they think their job was well done. Right? So, if you take this argument a little bit further, and you look at my film, and here I just take a little side anecdote. When we made the film, we thought half of the film is talking heads, old men you know from from the courts and you have to build in something a bit fresh like a, a case study or something some families telling you what the relationship is when we got the judges that are now in the film we knew we don't need a special um uh you know a special story line on the side to illustrate because they were actually saying something. And the reason why they're saying something is because they were commenting on what they did 14 years ago. They weren't just retelling us the story and, and, and you've seen the film. They weren't just saying, oh yeah, well, you know, let me sum up what we did last, the, the 14 years ago. No, they reflected on this stuff. That's what I think is the responsibility from the judges also. They're all part of the international community, okay? And it's not for them to do it. We asked them, we didn't coerce them into it. We didn't give them money or anything like that. They said, yes, we're ready. But now the, the, the second part of that question that you haven't, that we haven't come to is why did they do it to us and not to, you know, some kind of a committee, a tribunal, whatever it is, okay? And the answer is because we continuously monitor the impact of the wall or help to do advocacy on the ground. And because that, that continuity gave them the reassurance that they're not talking to some NGO somewhere, they're talking to somebody who's really keen on keeping that discourse alive okay okay yeah that, that, that's that's interesting uh speaking of impact the, 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 there's been a lot of discussion on you know what you perceive the impact of uh, the documentary to be uh, in terms of its uh, relevance to the the work of the icj uh, and the un efforts in in the you know israel palestinian conflict um i want to understand that you know essentially you know the term the the title of the film broken it talks about the broken promise of international law um, so how do you see you know it in terms of purely optics in terms of presenting a case of international law uh, you know you, you even in the documentary i believe it was judge uh, bergenthal in his dissenting opinion uh, you know who who says that you know the, the, there is it's very unlikely that the opinion is going to have, have any legal effect on the outcome uh, of the of the construction of the wall, uh, so you know, in terms of connecting all of this, um, you know, how do you see that your film adds to the existing discourse uh, on this conflict in terms of oh, international law? In terms of international law? In terms of international law? On the conflict as a whole, uh, you can yeah, you 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 can you can talk about the conflict as well, but mostly in terms of the inst inst institutional processes that you know deal with dealing with such uh, uh, issues in terms of uh, the international legal framework specifically. Hmm. 
Of course, there's shorter, midterm, and, and long-term uh, impacts. Okay, the long-term, I think we talked about um, education and so on, and, and and yes, keeping a discourse alive, which is otherwise dead. Um, okay, which you know um, would be a great pity because a lot of brilliant heads have worked on that opinion. Um, it's probably one of the, that's what I'm told. Probably one of the best researched opinions that there have ever been 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 done. Okay. Um, so, so short, medium, or long term also impacts direct or indirect. We know from what I read that one impact of the uh, advisory opinion has been that it furthered human rights law. This is what I read. This is what I what I what I understand. If it did that. That's, that's a good point, because it, the wall is not just international uh, uh, humanitarian law, it's also made, the whole case is made up of international uh, human rights law. So, but again, probably more in the indirect and longer term. Um, in terms of, I think, It, international law has had already impacts on the direct routing on the um, what we call the regime of the war accessibility or not okay it has produced um, an awful lot of material be they more secular or or academic um you know continuously uh, we get we get um uh, young people to ask us whether they could use our film for their master's thesis and so on and so forth that's important because those people that have do something like this they're also the ones a bit like me they're driven by something they have a, a vision they're not just there doing it because, oh, yeah, I need to have an MA behind my name. Okay. In that sense, there are people, and I know of people, filmmakers that have done amazing jobs. Okay. On documenting what otherwise goes by the wayside. Okay. It is at this stage difficult to say what exactly the impacts are if you're looking for you know physical kind of impacts and so on i think there are there are impacts that will be seen in the future that go way beyond that one wall okay um that I will tell you next time when we talk about uh, my next film about this. Okay, it it is this whole idea of building walls among peoples, and we know how many there are in the world. Okay, so um, so these are these are ideological impacts, philosophical impacts, I should think. Um, the law itself is totally sufficient, I think. We don't need new law for this case. Absolutely not. I think that that would be, you know, that would be a waste of time and a waste of money. Now, if that law helps other areas and other peoples, then that's fine. But I think the instrument of the law we have, I think um, Israel um, has also acknowledged certain things, such as the status of the settlements, at least by lip service which uh, many years ago wouldn't have been the case. And I think when we, when we see uh, Judge Meron talking about his uh, past, you know, I think there's probably a long way that that, that, that law has been pushing very slowly. Um, the wall, I don't see it as coming down immediately. It will be used as a negotiating uh, you know, object probably, um, as, <laughs> but only when people know what they want to negotiate. Uh, on both sides um, and, and at the moment that's as unclear as ever um, I think it's, um, it's it's a very unhealthy situation 
because you have too many too many um, very strong ideologies you know banging uh, heads against each other on both sides um, but I think if my film in this case can help to reinvigorate the discussion about what oh my god what have we done or what have we not done then from my side then the last sentence that you read where i'm standing on the wall you know to strengthen international law that aim has been fulfilled to a smaller or a, or a, or a bigger degree that's up to uh, history and other people to judge however there is one thing and this is a little anecdote which i think is incredibly telling we had a 15 year old girl writing to us from america she said um dear mr siegler would it be possible um that i could use your film as a um as a springboard for writing my end of year, year paper or something like that in florida somewhere okay um i'm not going to reveal who she was or anybody that's not so important but it, it's quite important to say she used that film in a most neutral way that you could think of. And she is of a very well-known Jewish family in the United States that you normally wouldn't associate okay, with that kind of stuff. The fact that her dad talked to me on the phone and we agreed that she can do what she thinks is right as long as it's not abusing one or the other side um, because she's a 15 year old okay and she did that out of her own will and everything and I think wow if we can get people of certain backgrounds whether they're 15 or not is not the point but of very of certain backgrounds to actually say that film does ask very important questions, not just about the war, but in general. And then it takes the steam out. And then you can have people like we had uh, 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 at one um, um, at one seminar of conference, a, a youth conference, we had a great number of people of Jewish background. And I was a bit nervous about showing the film in that context. But I can tell you, the word that was used um, by the keynote speaker, who's a very well-known um, lawyer in, 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 uh, in Israel, was the film is fair. There was no critique from either one or the other side over the years. And that fair has become like our target to say, that's what we keep working towards is to make sure that people are not alienated. You know, hate stuff is easy to produce, but to try to get people together and find a language, and now we're coming back to the very beginning, a language, a common language of international law, well, then I think it's worth every minute work, working for it. Okay, so uh, before I let you go, uh, you know, I, I, I want uh, you to talk a bit about uh, the upcoming uh, initiatives of Advocacy Productions and what is in the pipeline. And also, if you can uh, share if the documentary Broken is publicly available. And if it is, then where can people uh, find it? Okay, let me start with the end. It's the easiest. Yes, it is publicly available now, uh, either through our webpage or through um, Vimeo. Um, Vimeo on demand, it's called, and the film is broken. Broken film. We had to use a very short uh, version, so you can you can literally download it there. But um, people, I'm urging, and I'm, I I I think this might be the right place to actually say that, if I may. Um, we're selling licenses to universities, which uh, incorporate for a few 200 or $300 a year, you can have the film for the entire university 
at the library for research purposes um, and then for the teachers to use it in classrooms uh, everywhere. And that, um, that has to go through our webpage normally, or, or uh, yeah, that's probably the easiest, or you find us in, um, and you, I'm sure you, you, your uh, listeners are very aware of that, um, is the uh, word categories. So word, word cat uh, indication of, of, of films, books, etc. And if, there if, we... there's, if there's a uh, link, a URL link, if you can share that with me, I'll attach it with this uh, podcast yeah. uh, so that yeah. it'll be easier yeah, for sure. them to find it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So this is, is uh, how, how, how the film is available. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we are, it's also available for international organizations. We had a, a screening with Amnesty International uh, in many theaters and so on. So, yes, th these are, are the, the kind of public things that we do. The rest, uh, you know, we, we don't have a distribution agency, and, and that goes into the first part of your question. The distribution agencies um are uh, have not, not shown to be capable of sh of selling film and education <laughs> so we said we'll do it ourselves it'll be much much smaller uh, uh, and much uh, uh, um, easier but we don't want to have that film sold like uh, a toothpaste um or, or something which of course most people wouldn't be interested in anyway <laughs> okay but um, that makes sense so going back to your the other part of your question, we have now we have broken even publicly out there. Um, I'm taking broken to Armenia next week. I'm taking broken to Ghana next in the next in the by the end of the, the, the year for 10 day tours to people that are directly affected by conflict and stuff. Um, so this is this is where the film becomes a product. And that's why I also, also always refer to broken the project um, more than just the film. Um, the other thing that we have running concurrently is a, is a project called um, um, Behind the Chambers. Behind the Chambers are interviews with very well-known uh, international law experts um, such as um, uh, Dr. Abisab, no, Professor Abisab, I should say, George Abisab, um, whose interview will be coming up very soon. You know, talking about international law without any boundaries. We give them two questions, three, three or two or three questions. And then if they ask, if they're kind of, you know, if they're not quite sure where to go, we'll guide them. But we let them talk. And if somebody like, uh, you know, the, the, the director of the Geneva Academy, you know, talks for 40 minutes, um, then uh, Abisab was talking for two hours. Then it's entirely up to them. They define what they want to leave us with. It's, been, it's, it's seen as a lecture material. You can literally ask your students, um, you know, what do you think is the current state of international law? And then these people will talk about this. And in the second half, it'll be, um, uh, you know, Dr. Abisab or, or Professor Abisab, where do you think is the future of international law? That's all. It's very simple. And they, they talk to the camera. We have expert filmmakers to put this stuff together and editors to make this really a nice piece of work. And that again is, is available on, on, on Vimeo. So this is where we are going. We have just had another four people, um, um, what do you call it, um, special rapporteurs and others that are going to be on camera very soon. And we just go at our own pace. We keep uploading this stuff, right? Um, the next project that I was referring to that we're filming at the moment is Broken for the Curious. Um, I've already mentioned that. That'll be a 90 minute film that can go into cinemas and, and, and so on. Um, I am not pushed to actually come out with this film until we have serious people interested in it. Because I cannot go on paying for all of this stuff out of my own pocket. I mean, I'm, I'm a fool, but I'm not that much of a fool, okay? And so far I have spent 
way over uh, half a million dollars on my field projects out of my own pocket. And, uh, and that is, is the end. I can no longer, I don't want to do this any longer. If people don't think that our, our work is good enough to be paid, well then, okay, then I'll probably go to Hawaii or something and go surfing, <laughs> right? Um, I, although I don't like the whole idea of surfing. Um, the next project after that is going to be on walls. This is going to be a, also from a film making point of view, a very interesting uh, novel kind of approach. We will be using interview parts from the experts, and then we juxtapose them to the people on the ground that will tell us whether or not these experts are actually right in what they're saying. And that will do in probably about seven to 10 different locations in the world. Um, but done by local filmmakers and by local beneficiaries, like the Cox's Bazaar, etc. Et okay, <clears throat> this is a bit where we are with this. Okay, uh, perfect. Uh, that it's good to have a glance into your upcoming projects, uh, and you know, I'll especially be looking forward uh, to all of them, especially that uh, you know interview with uh, uh, George Abisab. Um, and yeah, it's 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 been a pleasure, uh, Stefan Ziegler, uh, and I'm sure our audiences will enjoy this conversation. Uh, and thank you so much for taking out time and you know being on the podcast. Uh, yeah, uh, and I'll see everybody else uh, in the next episode. Uh, thank you, Stefan. Thank you. Thanks a lot.